Hello, Night Watchers. I've got an assortment of stories for you today, featuring a monster in Sioux Falls, a demon that leaps from tree to tree, and a very haunted sanatorium. Enjoy these allegedly true scary stories, and be sure to send me your experiences at darkstories.org so I can narrate them. I'm open to all scary stories, but I'd really like to hear some Smoky Mountain stories soon. If you want more Darkness Prevails content, check out Freaky Folklore, my other show hosted by Carmen Carrion on Spotify or iTunes, documenting your favorite monsters, both ancient and modern. Now, let's begin. Mad Creature Chase from Jeff It was the late 70s and I lived in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where I'd been raised. Our large Victorian house was on a ridge close to downtown, and I had friends a couple blocks down the hill who were renting an apartment. My parents were at our lake house, so I had our family house to myself. Back in those days, we didn't even bother to lock our doors. It was probably around 2 a.m. and I began to walk home. My block was two blocks long compared to the blocks around us, so from my friend's house to mine, I had to climb a steep street for a couple blocks, then climb a long staircase, then pass through the back neighbor's yard and across the valley to our driveway and to my house. The neighbor told us, through my parents, that he was okay with this arrangement. So I started up the hill then noticed there was a noise behind me. I was under a streetlight, and under that light stood this strange humanoid figure. If it was human, it was the weirdest person I'd ever seen. It was dwarf-like, with very long arms and huge thighs. I immediately noticed it was very hairy too, especially on the head, but I could only see the black silhouette of it because it was directly under the streetlight. The second thing I noticed was that it was breathing very hard, very loud. At first, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I kept walking up the hill, looking back a couple of times. Then this thing started to run up the hill after me. I crossed the next street and started up the neighbor's steep steps and scrambled to their backyard gate. I could hear this thing climbing the stairs behind me, so I didn't stop. I ran across the valley and up the driveway next to our garage, and this thing was by that time almost to the alley behind me. I ran up the back porch and the back door was locked. I was so terrified I jumped over the railing and ran up the driveway to the front porch with this panting, stomping thing right behind me. Thank God the front door was unlocked. I threw myself in and slammed it shut. And that thing or person or whatever, it threw itself on the door. But I bolted it, then locked the inner foyer door and leaned against it, completely out of breath. But then it began to pace around my house. My mother had remodeled and put drapes and heavy damask over the windows but I could hear its heavy breathing as it seemed to try to look into every window. When I first observed it, it seemed short, but I swear I could see its shadows at the windows, which were all six feet or more off the ground. Then I was terrified that it would try to get into the basement through the ground level driveway door, which we rarely used. Cautiously, I went down the steps and was horrified to find that door unlocked. So quickly, I set the bolt and went into our very scary basement, relieved to find all the windows secure there. But I could still hear footprints in the backyard and the driveway. I went into the kitchen to my mother's desk and called my eldest brother, telling him someone was trying to break into our house. He said he'd be right over, then something began banging on the kitchen windows and kicking on the back door. I was so scared. I ran into the dining room and crawled under the table. Eventually, everything stopped. And after ages, my brother was yelling at the front door with his wife. When my parents returned a couple of days later, they said I was imagining things. But many years later, 
when I left Houston to visit my family for Christmas. My mother and I were sitting in the kitchen late at night, and there was a noise from the basement door behind me. She asked me if I had ever wondered if the old house was haunted, and I said I thought it just might be. She didn't say anything after that. She was an enigma. Not to mention, there were stories throughout the 70s of weird sightings in and around Sioux Falls. My Dead Landlord From Chris It all started a year and a half ago. My husband and I had just moved in together, and our first home was a farmhouse that we rented from his boss. Now, this house was beautiful, but it was only beautiful because my husband's boss's father had built the entire house by himself in the early 50s. The outside of it was once a stark white, but over the years, the paint had severely began peeling, and it was slightly tilted. The house was a two-bedroom, one-bathroom place, with a huge living room and kitchen, and a spirit larger than life. My husband's boss was named Bob, and we knew that his father had passed away in this house, but we knew that it was the bedroom toward the end of the house where he passed, so we just used it for storage. Things started getting weird in that house immediately after moving in. We would notice things in the corner of our eyes, see patches of smoke when there wasn't any in the room. But the first real scary occurrence was when we were watching The Woman in Black 2. It was about 3 in the morning, and in the country, of course, it was dead silent. At the climax of the movie, right when the movie gets silent, things got extra creepy in real life. We heard glass shatter in the kitchen next to our room. We hurried to pause the movie and stayed silent. We heard footsteps and then nothing. Freaked out because we had no animals, we opened the door, my husband Will gripping a baseball bat, just in case an intruder might be in there. We immediately noticed there was no one in there, but we did find the glass all over the kitchen and all over the kitchen table. We calmed down a bit and just chalked it up to being a freak accident. That happens sometimes, right? I remember asking myself that a lot during that time period. Well, time would go on and things stayed weird. Whenever I was washing dishes, I would always feel like someone was behind me. Whenever the toilet seat was left up, my towels on a shelf above would fall in. Eventually, and amazingly, the toilet lid would begin closing on its own. One day I was washing dishes and cleaning the kitchen when the lights went out for seemingly no reason. I remember panicking. I thought to myself, what do I do? Being a logical person, I thought in steps. These steps were necessary because we had no street lights around the house, so it was absolutely, completely pitch black. Step one, grab the keys on the edge of the table. Step two, grab the jacket with the cell phone on the chair. Step three, try to flip on the lights in the bedroom. Step four, run out of the house. I don't know why I had that response, but I felt threatened. I completed my steps in record time, opened the door, and jumped in my car, going to my mom's until Will came home. More time went on, and one morning Will and I were lying in bed watching the news, when he claims he saw the shadow of a man with a grey shirt walking through our door. Then things got even crazier. It was on a cold February night, and Will's mother came in for the weekend. We were sitting at the table, catching up, playing board games, when we heard something banging on the door. It was two in the morning so I knew it couldn't be anyone we knew. I quickly got up to look through the glass square to see who was banging on the door at 2 a.m., but no one was there. I definitely did not open those doors. I remembered the warnings my grandmother had given me about invisible visitors. I didn't want to invite anything into my home that wasn't supposed to be there. That night, we also started experiencing random puddles of water in the house. 
We thought it might have been poor insulation, but it was an odd substance. My mother-in-law, being ever so controlling, tried cleaning it up and failed. It had this oil-like texture to it and was practically impossible to clean, like slug juice or something. We carried on with our visit, then she went back to her hometown in Missouri. A couple of weeks later, we invited some friends of ours to hang out and drink some beers. We were all hanging out in the bedroom when we started talking about how the house was haunted. Now we were a bit intoxicated. We had an unspoken rule to never mention how haunted the house was while in the house, but we had some beers so we got a little too chatty about it. As we began talking, the plug-in lamp we have attached to the wall starts to flicker. It flickers for what seems like a couple of minutes and then stops. Needless to say, our couple of friends never decided to visit us there again. A month after all this, we decided to move into a cheaper rent house, closer to our workplaces. As we were cleaning the place, my mom noticed a fog of smoke, and baffled, she tried to swing her arms through it and failed. It stayed there for a moment, and finally evaporated. We once again shrugged it off and continued packing and cleaning. A couple of hours later, my mom opens the front door, which is heavy oak wood, to let some air in to relieve the smell of bleach. As she's bustling around the house, we noticed the door creak ever so softly, like it's about to slam shut. But then it stops halfway there and shuts so softly we barely hear it. A day later, Will and I were packed and ready to go. We went back to the house one last time to get the last few boxes. As we locked the door and sat in the car, we watched the first house we had lived in together. As we were staring, though, we noticed something weird. In the bedroom we had stayed in, we saw a man standing there looking out into the yard. No shadow, no fog, no apparition. We saw a solid figure of a man with gray hair and oval-shaped glasses, a gray work shirt, staring at the yard. He looked towards us, smiled, and waved. We were so speechless, we just sat there and looked. Will and I watched as this man in our house that was empty now walked away from the window. A few weeks after this, Will and his boss, Bob, were talking about the house. Bob mentioned the room we stayed in was the nicest because it was the master bedroom. You see, that was his father's bedroom, the one he died in. The one we purposely picked to avoid the room someone died in. But that's usually how things work out, isn't it? Especially when your husband takes care of the details. To this day, it's all so vivid. I'll never forget that house. And I'll never forget what happened. And I will definitely never forget the devilish smile of that man, burning his eyes into my soul. Tree Hopper from Night Master. When I was younger, I lived in the woods of Australia. I was about three years old when this story happened. My older brother, Josh, would always say he could see a man in the tree at the back of our wooden cabin. We had a big backyard, and it was surrounded by lots of big pine trees. He said there was a man who would sit at the back in one of the big trees and my brother would always go and talk to him. No one else had seen him, though. The next day, my brother said the man had hopped trees and got closer to the house. One tree a day, apparently. My mom was a very superstitious person. She believes in spirits, ghosts, demons, etc. She always said this man would never hurt us, and to some extent she was right but I never liked him. I got a very strange feeling when we talked about this man, and even to this day, I still get shivers thinking about him. One night, one of my mom's friends, who she had been fighting with lately, rung her up in a panic. She exclaimed that she had a dream, and said to not let us boys go down near the creek that was nearby, alone. She said that she had had a dream where some man had pushed my brother into the water, and drowned him. 
My mom believed her and said we couldn't talk to this man again. My brother said it was making the man very angry and he would make us sorry for her actions. Later that week, we had run out of firewood, so my dad, brother, and I went down to get some. Now, the only spot that had good firewood we could use, since it had been raining lately, was close to the creek, so my dad began cutting some wood. He ensured us he'd watch out for my brother, saying my brother would never be out of his sight, and paid very close attention to him. As he cut wood, I heard a strange noise coming down by the water. I had the urge to walk over there, as any innocent young child would. I had stayed close to my dad until then, so as I walked away, my dad didn't notice. He was keeping a closer eye on my brother, after all. I soon made it to the edge of the creek, when something pushed me, and the ground below me gave way. I fell right into the water. My dad was keeping such close attention to my brother to make sure he didn't fall in, I was the one who fell in. My dad luckily heard me go in the water. He rushed over and jumped in, pulling me out of the freezing cold water. It must have been around 24 degrees in there. My dad grabbed both of us, and we ran back home. Thankfully, I wasn't hurt too bad. Just cold, wet, and some scratches. We moved out of there shortly after, due to other supernatural experiences in that house, and it was nearing bushfire season. The fire was expected to pass around our house, but with the massive pine trees nearby, we didn't want to take the risk. Ever since then, we've never seen that man again, and I hope to never feel that gaze of someone piercing through your curtains. Whether it was a guardian angel who told my mom's friend or what, I'm just grateful we were warned. To the creepy ghost or demon thing, let's never, ever meet again. Scotland, from Big Rig 83. I work in close protection, from UK to Europe to Iraq, and in hostile environments. Doing this can be stressful. When home and off task, I like to get into the hills in Scotland. I decided to do a one-night camp in a well-known popular hiking and climbing area by a place called Eriker. I loaded up the jeep and my best friend, my dog Bear, who's a South African burble. He's a large guard dog, if you know the breed. Very large, well over 60 kilograms, or over 130 pounds American. So we get there, I set up camp, and we're isolated but there is a road in the distance. We go for a hike, then have a good night, settling down and I cook up some big steaks for the both of us. I also have a rum or two. Soon it's bedtime. I brought a large tent this time, so I set up Bear's bed inside the sitting area, and I take the bedroom. I lock up the tent, and we're off to bed. Sometime later, I wake up to the noise of the tent being touched, I sit up, still in my sleeping bag, trying to work out what's going on. I then see the wall of my tent moving, being pushed in, and working its way towards me. I wish I could say I wasn't scared, but I was. I didn't know what to do, so I threw a big right hook through the wall of the tent, and I connected with something. But there was no noise, no yelp, no footfall, no running. I grabbed my axe and got out of the bedroom. Bear was still somehow sleeping. She was a guard dog and an amazing one, usually. I then noticed the tent door was open at the top, like someone or something had peeked inside. I got out of the tent with Bear, looking for footprints or tracks, or even some lights on the nearby road, in case it was some sort of weird prank. But there was nothing, and I can't explain it. Heck, my guard dog didn't even hear anything. But I know I hit something. I put it down to maybe a loose sheep or something, but it's not really a farming area, and sheep don't really open doors and watch you while you sleep. Summer Night Wendigo Encounter From Crimson Lost Soul 
This happened when I was in the cadets. I don't remember the exact year of this event, but I think it was over 16 years ago. And I wasn't the only one who experienced it. There were at least 30 of us cadets, and at least 10 officers. We were all in the middle of a forest in northern Saskatchewan. I was with my cadet corps, along with several other cadet corps as well. It was a basic training course that we volunteered to go on. When we arrived, I felt uneasy, but I pushed it aside and thought that I was just being nervous being away from home for several nights. Every night we were out for our training course, we slept in tents we set up. Every day was uneventful. All we did was morning parade, followed by breakfast classes, lunch, and evening parade. Then dinner, followed by some free time before lights out. But the last night we were there was the most eventful. We all heard what sounded like two women screaming, waking literally everyone up. The officers told the cadets to stay in the parade square while they went to investigate the screams. But as the officers investigated the screams, I thought I saw something run into the woods, only to stop and look right at me. It seemed to look like a person, but I could see the bones under their skin, and it also seemed to have something covering its face. I stared at it for a few seconds before I saw another one, then suddenly the word Wendigo entered my mind. But I couldn't believe that. They both looked at me for a few more seconds, then ran off deeper into the forest. After a few minutes, the officers came back and made up a story that two female cadets were just trying to scare everyone and that we should just go back to sleep. I didn't bring up what I saw because I didn't want anyone to think I was crazy. Despite the Wendigo staring at me and me being terrified, I managed to fall asleep. The following day, I found two pairs of claw marks leading into the woods. I continued on, curious, and soon saw two pairs of glowing red eyes. But then I heard my friend call my name. I turned in his direction. He asked me if I saw the claw marks and I confirmed that I did, and he told me to stay away from those woods. As we were leaving, I saw one of those Wendigo again. I thought I heard one of them laugh as the buses drove away from the camp. Now that I think about it, I may have had an encounter with not one but two Wendigo. And that's what I'm scared about, because I know I wasn't the only one that saw them. I later learned that the friend that called me away from the woods told my sister that he also saw something in the woods and that he was afraid to tell me because he didn't want me to overreact. Fort San from Miss Canada This happened several years ago. My two friends, Eric and John, and I made a small road trip to this abandoned tuberculosis hospital called Fort San Sanatorium. A few days prior to the trip, I did some research, trying to get some history on the abandoned building. It's around a 45-minute drive from where I live to Fort San. On the way there, I had this gut feeling that something was off about the place, but I brushed it off, figuring it was just my nerves, because I read up on the different ghosts that supposedly call that place home. As for the history of the place, Fort San Sanatorium is located in the middle of the small town of Fort San. It was built in 1912 for patients ill with tuberculosis. Because the development of medicine was still in its early stages, many patients passed away, children more than adults. And because the families didn't want to contract the illness, the patients who passed away were buried on site. Over the years, many of the patients suffered not only from their illness, but neglect and abuse. My grandmother told me the story of my grandpa having to be admitted there when he contracted TB. For three years, he suffered abuse, and that did affect him over the years after he was discharged. But the people who were admitted to Fort San had a very hard time there, and to this day, you can still feel the sadness and loneliness that haunts those walls. Anyways, back to the story. Once we arrived there, the feeling of dread came over me. I told Eric that I felt that something was wrong. 
He told me that I was just scared and that him and John would protect me if we came across anything weird. Let me inform you these two guys were both over six feet and bulky. However, growing up with a sensitivity to the supernatural, I knew something wasn't right, and this wasn't just me being scared. We continued to walk closer to the first building. There's only three buildings left, from the several buildings that were there before the sanatorium was finally closed officially in the 1970s. We got to the front door of the first building, again the feeling of dread rushing through my body. But to prove I wasn't going to let fear get the best of me, I followed Eric and John into the building. We had to turn the flashlights on our phones on, because on the first floor the windows were all boarded up. We turned them on and began to walk further into the building. It was very cold, and the building looked like it was just closed for the day. Everything in there was preserved pretty well, minus the few hooligans turning desks and chairs over. We slowly walked down the right corridor looking into the rooms. I was still freaking out inside, but the beauty of the building was actually quite calming, and in no time I forgot about the feeling of dread. We continued to look around on the first floor. Once done, we moved to the second floor, then to the third and fourth, and before we knew it, we were off to the building next door. That feeling of dread that dwindled away earlier came back with force. Something bad was going to happen, I just knew it. But being the skeptics they are, Eric and John told me I was just scared, that they would protect me. We entered the second building. I stood there asking where John had gone, because he immediately ran upstairs when we got in here. Eric answered, don't worry about him, come look at this. Before I could even move, this icy cold feeling came around me. I stood there afraid to turn, or even look around, in fear of seeing something I didn't want to see. I could feel this cold moving around, and then I felt these small little icy cold fingers caress my hand. I was in shock, not wanting to believe what was happening. I told myself that it was my head playing tricks on me, so I ran over to Eric. He began to show me these documents. I read, Patient Anna J. Smith, Date of Birth, April 2nd, 1907, Death, August 14th, 1918. It dawned on me that this was the building for the children, and those little fingers I felt only moments before were that of a child. I began to freak out, and I yelled at Eric, We need to leave now! John must have heard me yelling from upstairs, because he came rushing down to see what was going on. John, I said terrified, I want to leave. But before John was able to respond, Eric butted in. No, we have one more building to look at. You can stay with me while we explore the last building, okay? Not wanting to be in there anymore, but knowing the boys really wanted to check the bigger building out, I just agreed. We went over to the last building. I didn't want to go in, but I didn't want to be left alone, so John, Eric, and I entered that building. This place is huge, John said, looking like a kid in the candy store. Once again, he ran off to look around. Eric kept his promise and did not leave my side, though. We began to look around, and for the first maybe 15 minutes, everything seemed to be okay. We worked our way up to the third floor, but that's when things began to get creepy, and yet again, that feeling of dread came back. Not only the feeling of dread, but of someone being there with us. I could sense a female of some sort. I tried to ignore it and continued to look around. Eric quickly got my attention and said, Do you hear that? Me trying to brush it off out of fear, I replied, I Hear what? The... And before I could finish what I was saying, he shushed me and said, Don't you hear that? That clicking? Sounds like someone is clicking a pen. Then I began to hear the clicking too. We rushed over to where the sound was coming from, but once we got there, it stopped. There was a desk there. We began to look through the desk and the papers that were thrown all over the floor looking for the source of that sound, but there was nothing. As I began to talk, Eric shushed me again. Do you hear that? That breathing sound? I stopped and tried to listen. It did sound like someone gasping for air. I was seriously freaking out now but Eric told me to follow him to find the sound, so I did. 
and brought us to this patient room. I began to sense the female again. We could still hear the breathing. We both entered the room, and again it just stopped. Eric was getting weirded out by now, and just stepped out of the room to look down the hallway. In a matter of seconds, I heard giggling, and the door slammed shut. I was trapped in the room. Thinking Eric was just fooling around, I yelled at him. Eric, stop! You're not funny! Let me out! Eric yelled in at me. It's not me! I tried to open the door, but it was locked. So I yelled, get me out of here! John must have heard me, because he rushed to us from downstairs. He asked us what was going on. Eric and I were struggling to open the door. John jumped in to try to get the door open, and finally, after what felt like minutes, the door was opened. I was crying and out of breath. I ran into Eric's arms, shaking, and after that happened, John and Eric finally believed me about my gut feeling. We ran out of there so fast, and while we were leaving, what was supposed to be an empty building felt more like hundreds of people were there watching us as we ran for our lives. I want to say I never went back, but I would be lying. After that ordeal, I lost contact with John and Eric. John moved away, and Eric actually had a mental breakdown. He was in a hospital for a while, and I found out he was diagnosed with psychosis. I guess what was there must have attached itself to him, because he was never the same after that day. I have been back to Fort San recently. It still looks the same from when I went there years ago but the energy there is so much darker. People have left pentagrams and weird ritual objects. I'm braver than I was when I was younger, but there's something there I don't want to attach to me. I've seen what looks like children trying to play peekaboo from behind the trees near the buildings, and I know those aren't children. You can hear footsteps and see no one coming. You can hear a ball bounce, and nothing's there. All I can say is don't go searching for evil because you don't know what will follow you home.